Um, okay, I think we're going to get started. First of all, I just want to thank all of you for being here, for joining us in our subterranean um, uh, space. I have to say I feel very comfortable as an underground man. Um, uh, I suppose invoking Dostoevsky at a conference on anti-Semitism is a little bit of a problem. Um, but there's a panel on Hannah Arendt, and uh, I, I feel somewhat tempted to say uh, a number of things that, uh, that I would have liked to have said about uh, engaging with the larger issues that the con conference presents. I'll just restrict my comment to one thing, which is that Arendt, in terms of her relationship to uh, the Jewish community and to the um, broader community to find her position in terms of that of the conscious pariah. And it seems to me that this specific critical position that calls for attention to um, a, a, a modes of strategic defense against those who, um, external from the community, are hostile to it, at the same time that one is able to engage critically within the community, <coughs> to think strategically and tactically, um, theoretically and self-reflexively about some of the problems that themselves are reiterated sometimes um, in the, in the uh, well-intentioned effort to dampen down the problem that one uh, is engaged in uh, trying to combat, i.e. anti-Semitism in this particular context. This seems to be a very healthy um, place from which to speak. And you'll see that it's precisely that place from which I speak in relationship to um, Hannah Arendt's own work. Um, this uh, talk that I'm going to be giving is um, part of a, a larger project that I've been working on for a long time since I uh, uh, was a postdoc at, at Hebrew University. It's a project called Critical Theories of Anti-Semitism, Confronting Modernity and Modern Judeophobia. What I'm doing in the project is looking at the major theories and theorists, the major paradigms that have been offered for explicating um, the underlying causes of anti-Semitism. So there are chapters on uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, Hannah Arendt, members of the Frankfurt School, sociological uh, approaches focusing on Talcott Parsons and Zygmunt Bauman, and uh, postmodern approaches, in particular that of Leo Dao uh, and some others. And then I look at two historians, uh, Leon Polyakov and uh, his understanding of the nom du rey, and George Moss and his understanding of modernity and anti-Semitism. And each of these figures themselves represents a paradigm. So uh, existential, what I'm going to be calling in the context of Arendt, interactionist or historical approaches. Uh, socio-psychoanalytic approaches, that's the Frankfurt School, sociological uh, and, and postmodern approaches, and looking at the ways in which those are integrated into the historiography. And so each of these individual figures actually represents a, a, a point of entry into a broader uh, um, set of, of engagements with the issue from within, within that paradigm. And, you know, we were asked to give papers that last 20 minutes, so what I've done uh, here is really take a, a much longer chapter on Arendt and unfortunately just distill it down to the bare conclusions uh, of, of that chapter. So I'll just give you a little sense of what I do in the larger uh, chapter. Um, I open up by talking a little bit about uh, Hannah Arendt's biography and the reception of her work and the ways in which it has uh, turned from seeing her as a universal uh, um, cosmopolitan a philosopher towards the embodiment of the Weimar German Jewish experience um, and, and what that indicates in relationship to her own um, conception of the need to tell history via storytelling, sometimes by focusing on, on, on men in dark times or, as we might say in this particular context, on, on a woman in dark times. Um, and then I go into a long section looking at Hannah Arendt's uh, methodology or her meta-history uh, that I'm not going to be able to do any more than barely telescope uh, here. And then what I do is engage in a careful, uh, I hope, I hope a careful reconstruction of Hannah Arendt's story of modern anti-Semitism 
and, um, and then engage in my critique. So a reconstruction and then uh, um, a deconstruction in, in, the, in the rigorous Derridian sense of, of that. Um, in other words, I think I take the position of the conscious pariah also with respect to Arendt's own work. Hannah Arendt's most significant contribution to the theorization of anti-Semitism is her insistence on its historicization. She was a trenchant critic of existential approaches like Safa's, accounts like those advanced by the Frankfurt School that emphasized so so socio-psychoanalytic concepts like projection, scapegoat theories, or worst of all, the notion of an eternal anti-Semitism. Each of these theoretical approaches misconstrues anti-Semitism because each fails to examine the intertwined history of Jews, anti-Semitism, and the Jewish question within a more general history of modern Europe. What makes Arndt's approach to anti-Semitism distinctive amongst its theorists is consequently what I call her interactionist understanding of it as the story of the role of the Jews in relation to dominant society over the course of modernity. What I propose in this paper is to examine the relationship between Arndt's theory of history, uh, uh, of what she calls storytelling, and the story that she tells about the history of modern anti-Semitism. I argue that while her intention is to write a history that brushes against the grain of conventional historiography, because it seeks to destroy its object, that is anti-Semitism, rather than preserve it, Arendt nevertheless reiterates certain anti-Semitic motifs in her account. This is one of the larger questions that I'm interested in, the question of how is it that anti-Semitism is able to be perpetuated, or anti-Semitic motifs, stereotyping, is able to be perpetuated, and how can one actually see this at work in some of its most sophisticated critics? That's one sort of strand that runs through a, a, a lot of my work, not only in this project, but Interestingly, it's precisely in, in um, her, her approach to uh, the, the history that she writes that she reinscribes some of the problems that are the targets of her critical historiography. For it's the case that Arendt's understanding of Jewish history is what forges the causal links between the elements that crystallize in totalitarianism, such that Jews are depicted as both at the origins and the victims of modernity. Arendt's analysis ultimately depends upon the analogic use to which Jews are put in her account of social anti-Semitism. Her categorical insistence on the supranational character of the Jewish people, and most problematically, on the role of Jews in the development of financial capitalism. For Arendt, writing the history of anti-Semitism poses unique methodological problems. For historians, quote, had to write the history of a subject which they did not want to conserve. They had to write in a destructive way, and to write history for purposes of destruction, which is somehow a contradiction in terms. The way out of this dilemma, for most who have undertaken the effort before her, she maintains, was to make the Jews the object of conservation, and to examine the, the events from the viewpoint of the victims which for Arendt has resulted in a history of apologetics, of victimology, which she derisively states, quote, is no history at all. Arendt thus spurned conventional approaches to history in favor of what she calls storytelling. She was critical of any form of historical determinism that claimed to know the laws of development in history, especially those predicated on, uh, upon class or race as the keys to history which she saw as part of the latent logic that had resulted in the disasters of the 20th century. She condemned causality as the deduc deduction of the unprecedented from precedence, critiqued analogic thinking as the reduction of difference to the logos of the same, and derided universalization as ideology built on the denial of particularity. Rather, inspired by both the fragmentary historiography urged by uh, Walter Benjamin, and the Ursprung philosophy of Martin Heidegger, Arendt conceived of history as the weaving of discrete narratives framed to comprehend the events and processes under consideration. In short, the historian is a storyteller who rescues the past from oblivion, illuminating the dark times of human existence with meaning-making narratives 
Arendt's approach was thus neither an objectivism nor a relativism, neither a historicism nor a presentism, but what Lisa Ditch calls a situated impartiality that brings to bear a plural and perspectival approach that sought to recreate the past as a shared world where the historian never represents only one view on that past. Historical events are made by a plurality of individual stories that form a complex matrix of meaning. Since Arndt insisted on multiple perspectives, both within events and in reflecting on events, there are also many versions of historical truth. Situated impartiality is thus neither objective nor relative, precisely because it depends upon, and I'm quoting Ditch here, perspectival differences being raised, contested, and situated in, in reference to each other. Arendt's approach to history is also critical of the politicization of memory that Jean-Francois Lyotard has called the memorialization of the past. As Sheila Ben-Habib has argued, what is foregrounded in her analysis is the politics of memory and the morality of historiography. In short, Arendt presciently helped us to theorize a perspectival approach to history as storytelling and offered us multiple exemplary exercises in this approach to the past. Arendtian history as storytelling analyzed individuals, memorials, anecdotes, concepts, incidences, and institutions. She practiced a, begriff, a, a, a Begriffsgeschichte, which located instances of rupture in the past in order to rethink through remembering, using the ruins of the past as the shards of history that enable us to comprehend the present. Arendtian storytelling thus makes history a praxis, as Ditch puts it, whose purpose is to defend abstract principles or object is not to defend abstract principles or objective facts, but to tell provocative stories that invite contestation from rival perspectives. The ambiguous space of historical writing thus serves to encourage debate and reinterpretation that makes situated impartiality and plurality possible to begin with. Now that we've briefly appreciated the complexity of Arendt's meta-history, I want to suggest that in contrast to Arendt's objections to Eric Vogelin's famous review of the origins of totalitarianism, which is the most succinct statement on Arendt's part, her response to that review by, by Vogelin, is the most succinct statement of her historical methodology, uh, that actually Vogelin, and she argues that Vogelin had misunderstood her project. In fact, Vogelin's construal of the origins of totalitarianism actually constitutes a sophisticated account of her work. While Vogelin clearly, uh, certainly understood origins, causes, and the relation of the parts of the book to the whole differently than Arendt, his account of her multifaceted text is quite acute, even though, as a review, it only emphasizes the central strand in her pastiche of stories. He opens his review by stating that the origins, quote, is an attempt to make contemporary phenomena intelligible by tracing their origin back to the 18th century. Doing so, Vogelin suggests that Arndt's work is a genealogy of totalitarianism in the Foucaultian sense, with its point of departure as a history of the present. He correctly indicates that while the three parts of the text are roughly chronological, the overlaps in time in her story are important. Anti-Semitism begins to rear its head in the Age of Enlightenment. The imperialist expansion and the pan movements reach from the middle of the 19th century to the present and the totalitarian movements belong to the 20th century. The sequence is, furthermore, an order of increasing intensity and ferocity in the growth of totalitarian features towards the climax in the atrocities of the concentration camps. He indicates quite rightly that the center that animates Arendt's discussion is the destruction of European Jewry. He proceeded to elucidate the governing theme as the rise and fall of the nation state, until its virtual dissolution, creating the mass society of the 20th century. With every transformation, new sections of society become superfluous, 
and their legal, social, and economic status is therefore threatened. Centralization of the nation state and the rise of bureaucracy made the aristocracy superfluous. Growth of industrialization and new sources of revenue made Jews as state bankers superfluous. And every industrial crisis created superfluous human beings through unemployment. In the 20th century, and one should add still today, wars and totalitarian regimes create millions of refugees, which aren't called the stateless, those who were unmoored from their communities by the processes of modernity, becoming what Agamben calls bare life or, as Arendt puts it, the rightless scum whose only logical place ultimately became the internment and slave labor of the concentration camps, the, laboratory of the, total the laboratories of the totalitarian society. As Vöglin describes it, each section of Arendt's history is the necessary, although not sufficient, condition for the future synchronic structure of totalitarianism as it crystallized in the 20th century. Vogelin even insightfully suggests that Arendt's method is best likened, likened to Thucydides, who also spans an arc, quote, from the presently moving events to their origins. In chapter one, anti-Semitism is an outrage to common sense, Arendt criticized both eternal anti-Semitism and the scapegoat theory. She then laid out her own thesis that it's the role of Jews in relation to dominant society and reciprocally of the Jews' relationship to the nation-state that is the basis of anti-Semitism in the modern period. It is as such that her model can be characterized as interactionist. Moreover, she suggested that the so-called Jewish problem constitutes a reversal of cause and effect and is thus an outrage to common sense. I'm quoting Arndt here. There's hardly an aspect of contemporary history more irritating and mystifying than the fact that of all the great unsolved political questions of our century, it should have been this seemingly small and unimportant problem that had the dubious honor of setting the whole infernal machine in motion. Such discrepancies between cause and effect outrage our common sense, to say nothing of the historian's sense of balance and harmony. Compared with the events themselves, all explanations of anti-Semitism look as if they had been hastily and hazardously contrived. To cover up an issue which so gravely threatens our sense of proportion and our hope for sanity. She argued that two approaches to dealing with anti-Semitism in particular had lost this outrageous history. The scapegoat theory and eternal anti-Semitism. Arndt refuses the scapegoat theory because it implies that there could have been another scapegoat and, there, and thereby denies the particular history that resulted in the persecution and extermination of Jews. She derided the scapegoat theory with a joke that functions as a reductio ad absurdum. An anti-Semite claimed that the Jews had caused the war. The reply was, yes, the Jews and the bicyclists. Why the bicyclists, asked the one. Why the Jews, asked the other. She argued that whenever you try to explain something by the scapegoat theory, you have to begin to reconstruct the historical events. As soon as you do so, the scapegoat in its abstraction is left behind, and you become, quote, involved in the usual historical research where nothing is ever discovered except that history is made up by many groups and that for certain reasons, one group was singled out. In addition to its inherent ahistoricism, Arndt also repudiates the scapegoat theory because, quote, it upholds the perfect innocence of the victim, in this case, making the Jewish scapegoat blameless, which thereby discharges the victim of responsibility. While this is certainly the case, interactionist approaches risk the reverse, risk the reverse, which is to blame the victim, as we will consider in more detail below. If the scapegoat explanation is one means to escape the complex history of anti-Semitism, then eternal anti-Semitism is another. Eternal anti-Semitism is the claim that hatred of Jews and Judaism is trans-historical, operating according to the same modes and methods over time. This makes anti-Semitism a natural reaction to which history gives only more or less opportunity. 
Eternal anti-Semitism answers the question, why the Jews, with the bet question begging reply, eternal hostility. For Arendt, that eternal anti-Semitism is the doctrine adopted by professional anti-Semites to legitimate their position is, serves as a significant warning against its use. After all, if everywhere Jews have lived at all times, they have been hated, despised, envied, and criticized, the reasoning of the anti-Semite goes. There must be a natural, trans-historical ground to these attitudes to Jews and Judaism that legitimates them. In a mirror image of the anti-Semitic position, Art maintains that Jews use the notion of eternal anti-Semitism as a means of cohering Jewish identity, since at the same moment as anti-Semitism arose, Jews were threatened from without and within, and anti-Semitism emerged as a way to keep them together. Hence, eternal anti-Semitism enables both anti-Semites and Jews to remain blameless for anti-Semitism. Quote, just as anti-Semites understandably deny, desire to escape responsibility for their deeds, so Jews, attacked on the, and on the defensive, even more understandably, do not wish under any circumstances to discuss their share of responsibility. Given the time constraints here, I can offer no more than the brief sketch I've given of the origins of totalitarianism in the light of Goldman's review. Uh, but before I, I move on, um, I want to just consider how Arendt, uh, before I conclude, I want to just consider how Arendt's narrative, which ascribes to Jews an equivocal causal function, rather than systematically destroying the anti-Semitic -se uh, system of thought that she assesses, actually reinscribes Jews within prevalent anti-Semitic technologies. I'll offer three brief examples. After addressing the political and socioeconomic factors that account for anti-Semitism in her second chapter, in her third chapter, The Jews in Society, Arndt offers a brilliant analysis of social anti-Semitism in the face of what Michael Maris has termed the politics of assimilation. But in the section of that chapter, titled Between Vice and Crime, focused on the Salon of Faubourg Saint-Germain via the writing of Marcel Proust, Arndt posits what seems an uncritically digested parallelism between homosexuality and Judaism that verges on reiterating 19th century images of the Jew as perverted, promiscuous, debauched, lecherous, and feminized. In short, as the inversion of the norm, or queer. Arndt's point is surely to emphasize how the fin de siècle constituted mass identities and that queer Jews whether uh, uh, that queers, whether Jews or inverts, as she calls them, were accepted only because they were fascinating and exotic types. The conflation of the stereotypes of these two queers is reiterated by Arendt, however, rather than problematized. Quote, it's true that to the recording onlooker, the behavior of the Jewish clique showed the same obsession as the behavior patterns followed by inverts. In addition to reiterating rather than evaluating the discursive construction of the queerness of Jewishness, she does not adequately undermine the notion that Jews were inherently a queer nation, the alien nation, the outsiders, foreigners, the nation within the nation, since she constantly identifies Jews as the paradigm of the supranational group. Quote, the Jews had been the purveyors in wars and the servants of kings, but they did not and were not expected to engage in the conflicts themselves. When these conflicts enlarged into national wars, they still remained an international element whose importance and usefulness lay precisely in their not being bound to any national cause. Arndt's position stems in part from her insistence that political anti-Semitism was not essentially a nationalist, but was rather an imperialist pan-movement. Quote, the Jews very clearly were the only inter-European element in the national Europe. It seemed only logical that their enemies had to organize on the same principle, 
if they were to fight those who were not supposed to be the secret manipulators of the political destiny of all nations. Not only does Arendt underemphasize the importance of nationalist anti-Semitism, but Jewish assimilation appears as always already foreclosed, not only as a result of the historical processes of nation-state formation, but because of Arendt's positing of the inherent character of Jewish internationalism and cosmopolitanism. She also significantly underplays the importance of Zionism in all of its permutations, a topic that was, of course, a significant preoccupation of her thought in the period preceding the origins. Finally, and most problematically, in her account, uh, uh, in, her, in her account of the Jewish role in fostering the ac economic activity of the state, Arendt suggests that financial alliances are the only bond that, quote, ever tied a Jewish group to another stratum in society, end quote. Pierre Birnbaum has thus suggested, by adopting, and I'm quoting him here, by adopting strangely the analyses of a Drummond, which as far as the role of the Jews is concerned, are akin in some respects to those of a Marx, Arendt postulates a purely economic interpretation of the Jews' place in the state, which Birnbaum rightly contends was a flawed hunch, only partly valid with respect to Germany and questionable as a description of French history. Like Marx's Sur Judenfrage, Arendt places the Jewish question at the center of her early critique of modernity, too closely identifying Jews with financial capitalism and financial capitalism with the dissolution of politics, the nation state, and individuality. This breakdown threatened to degenerate into the atomistic, antagonistic egoism that destroys species being in Marx and produces the loss of what Arendt terms world being. To sum up, in concluding her account of the transformation from crime to vice, Arendt argues that in her analysis, quote, social factors emerge, unaccounted for in political or economic history, hidden underneath the surface of events, never perceived by the historian and recorded by the more penetrating and passionate force of poets or novelists that one needs to appreciate in order to understand the Jews' fateful journey to the storm center of events, which resulted in the passion-driven hunt of the Jew in general, the Jew everywhere and nowhere. In insisting on the poesis of storytelling to unveil what is hidden beneath the surface of events, Arendt closes the hermeneutic circle of the story that I have sought to open by examining the relation between her meta-history as storytelling and the story that she tells of anti-Semitism. As I briefly tried to show, in her description and analysis of anti-Semitism, Jews are identified not only as symbols of what society does not accept, but at the origins of the degenerating influences of modernity, financial capitalism, the nation state, and the bourgeoisie. Jews are situated in the interstices of the fundamental bifurcations that constitute the central categories that structure her thinking. Between past and present, tradition and innovation, anti-modernity and modernity, state and nation, and society and politics. In short, Jews are caught in the double binds between the pariah and the parvenu, between being Jewish and assimilating into European society and culture. There is an ambivalence in the story that Arendt tells that makes it difficult to determine whether her account is caught within contradictions produced by her own distinctions or those of the Western tradition that she seeks to analyze. It's sometimes difficult to demarcate in Arendt's story when she echoes the anti-Semitic tradition she wants to critique and when her analysis of it offers a nuanced description of the paradoxes of the Jewish condition in modernity. This is because Arendt's insights traverse the dichotomies that structure her understanding of anti-Semitism, politics, and modernity, even as the Jew that underpins her interpretation ambivalently transgresses these distinctions occupying an ambiguous, often contradictory situation. Arendt noted of other thinkers that, quote, fundamental and flagrant contradictions rarely occur in second-rate writers in whom they can be discounted. In the work of great authors, they lead into the very center of their work, 
and are the most important clue to a true understanding of their problems and new insights. Like Arendt's own story, which is itself fraught with the tensions and, and ambiguity of her own universality and particularity, Germanness and Jewishness, her political theory and her histories that focused on sociocultural singularities, the relation between her theory of history as storytelling and the story of her history of anti-Semitism demands to be reevaluated and rethought. In the chiasma that I have traced between Arendt's perspectival approach to history and the perspectives she unfolds in her history of anti-Semitism, her account of the, and I'm quoting her here, the double origins and equivocal meaning of modern Jewish history opens her story to internal contestation and reinterpretation at the same time as revealing the importance of the interactionist approach to anti-Semitism that Arendt pioneered. Thank you very much, gentlemen. That was a fascinating paper, and uh, for what it's worth, fascinatingly complimentary to, to what I want to say. Brown and I did not share our papers before this, so I'm being very pleasantly uh, surprised by what I just heard. Because there's only two of us, we are going to have a whole lot of battle time for discussion afterwards, so I hope that both of the presentations will uh, provoke questions and commentary and critique. Um, Jonathan, very aptly, what, this is Jonathan and I'm Peter, for those who are paying attention to the, the little program. Jonathan very aptly pointed out that our work invites contestation. And what I am going to do today is definitely and strongly contest some of the central strands in exactly the same work that Jonathan focused on. Now, Arendt wrote enormous uh, numbers of different pieces at different points in her life that all converge on this question of the possible history of anti-Semitism, but I am going to focus very squarely just on one of them, namely the first third, the first of the three sections of the origins of totalitarianism. So I'm not going to address the Eichmann controversy, for example. I'm not going to address what I think are some of her most fascinating essays from the 1940s as she is rethinking her own position vis-a-vis -vis Zionism and what was then becoming the mainstream of Zionism. I'm just going to look at this, uh, this anti-Semitism chapter, essentially the same text that, um, that Jonathan is also focused on. And for what it's worth, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today is, for better or worse, not that new. I wrote the paper that I'm sort of summarizing right now in 2005 and then foolishly sat on it for five years. And uh, last year, last October, um, Bernard Wasserstein, a very good historian at the University of Chicago, came out with a piece in the Times Literary Supplement, September 9th, I think, 2009, that says more or less exactly what I wanted to say. So I got. I got scooped. Um, also, just this past March, uh, Shlomo Abineri had a wonderful piece in the English language online version of Haaretz, which is essentially a review of uh, Origins was apparently just now translated into Hebrew, which, which I didn't know, which is fa you know more than half a century later, which is a fascinating little factoid all in itself. But he wrote this very perspicacious review, and he also, Abineri also made a lot of the points that I would have made. So I think that my little paper here will probably never see the light of day, but I'll nonetheless grace all of you with my now obsolete insights uh, <laughs> into it. Confirmed insights. Confirmed, exactly. I've been confirmed by much, by, uh, by much subtler minds than my own. Um, and also, just to make clear, I, like Jonathan, I am generally a, a fan of Arendt. I am not usually as harsh a critic as I am going to be today, but I am quite harshly critical for a lot of reasons of the particular portion of her work that I am uh, uh, looking at. But unlike Wasserstein, for example, for those of you who read Wasserstein's article in the Times Literary Supplement last September, he essentially uses the, the, the grave problems that I agree with about the anti-Semitism section of Origins of Totalitarianism as a springboard to more or less... Am I going too fast? I'm sorry. I have a very hard time speaking slowly. Um, you may need to remind me. I get very engaged but I'm sorry. Uh, I will try to slow down my delivery a bit. Wasserstein essentially uses the problems that he sees uh, in this book as a way of more or less saying, let's radically deflate the unfairly inflated reputation that Arendt has garnered and let's sort of toss overboard a lot of the rest of her insights. That is essentially the opposite of my own take. I think that the problems in Arendt's account 
can and should be disentangled from much of the rest of her work, and I do not think that they doom the rest of her social theory, but that is something on which reasonable people can very much disagree. Um, the Origins of Totalitarianism was first published in 1951, although she actually finished the manuscript in late 1949. Now that's extraordinarily early. That means that Arendt was writing under the immediate impact of the Holocaust, of the Shoah, and that strongly shows up in the work she was writing while Stalin was still very much alive and very much in control. Hitler, of course, had been dead for four years, but Stalin certainly wasn't, and a lot of the book is, uh, is essentially about Stalinism and Nazism as her two classic instances of achieved totalitarianism. She did a renewed edition in 1958, strongly under the influence of the abortive Hungarian Revolution uh, two years earlier, and then a sort of definitive edition, the last edition published and revised and published during her lifetime, came out in 1968, and Arendt died in, in 1974. I'm going to look at the 1968 edition because I see it as the sort of most definitive authorized uh, version of the book. And also in 1968, she came out with uh, three separate paperbacks, which were simply reprintings, with the same pagination and everything, of the whole origins of totalitarianism. So the one, the first book is called simply Anti-Semitism, which is the name of the, uh, of the first. Third, the second one is Imperialism, the third one is Totalitarianism. Um, so in a sense, you could say that she saw the 1968 version as her definitive statement on the history of anti-Semitism, so much so that she was happy to publish it as its separate self-standing work. At the same time, I don't think that part of the book, the first third of Origins, I don't think it really is a historical account of the, the development of anti-Semitism. For what it's worth, I don't really think Origins as such is a story of Origins. I a little bit disagree with Vogelin's otherwise uh, wonderfully perceptive review on that score, I see origins of totalitarianism more as a kind of typology, a way of discussing essences more than discussing actual origins or genesis or development. There is sort of a static element to a lot of Arendt's analysis there. Now as a historian, and that's what I am, that can be problematic, but that's okay. She, she was not, in my view, writing primarily as a historian, thank goodness. She was writing primarily as a political philosopher. I see the book as an extended essay in political philosophy, so it doesn't really make sense to hold it up to the standards of traditional academic historiography. Those were not the standards that she set for herself, but there are nevertheless lots of historical insights. Uh, in the book. Now, one quick thing about uh, Arendt's style, she had a famously apodictic style. She, she, um, to say that she was given to overstatement would be an understatement. It was one of her uh, standard stylistic flourishes to make these grand sweeping claims and make them very universal and very firm and very confident. She did that for those words in both her German writings and in her English writings. I'm the kind of person who likes that sort of style, but it does open her up sometimes to to very easy uh, uh, counterattacks. If you really say that the full truth really was X, Y, and Z, it's hard to capture the full truth in any historical account. So that's a, it's sort of a dangerous and, and risky move. And some of what I'll say here, she more or less retracts in a later footnote, or 17 pages later in the text, she'll give a more nuanced account. But the points that I want to focus on are the ones that have become famous in her book, uh, rightly or wrongly, and stand as sort of her uh, her legacy. Now quickly, there are a bunch of things that I think are very worthwhile in her account of anti-Semitism, even though I'm going to spend the next 17 minutes ripping apart what I think is wrong with it. And those include two of the things that Jonathan pointed to. One, she rejects scapegoat theories and gives a very perceptive uh, reason for rejecting those. Two, she rejects the eternal anti-Semitism thesis. I strongly agree with both of those moves on her part. That is not an aspect of my criticism. She also insists, as Jonathan points out, on historicizing, on, on offering a historically contextualized account of anti-Semitism as a specific phenomenon, one that grows out of specific, a specific set of social conditions and didn't just drop out of the sky and uh, arrive from Mars. Uh, she's good, I think, in general, good, I quibble with details, but good on connecting anti-Semitism to racism, colonialism, imperialism, the rise of the nation state. I like that approach in general, even though I disagree with a lot of what she specifically says. She also insists, and this is important, in 1949 to 1951, she insists on taking Nazi versions of anti-Semitism seriously. 
taking them at their own word and analyzing them as an actual object of study and not just something to be dismissed and derided and stayed away from. That's important. And uh, last but not least, she offers a really interesting critique of leftist versions of anti-Semitism. One of the sub-chapter headings in one of those chapters in the first third of Origins is called Leftist Anti-Semitism. Now for someone like me who is a leftist and who constantly encounters anti-Semitic assumptions, the intentional and not among my comrades, that's really nice to see that early a, uh, a picking apart of some of those uh, ideas and thought worlds. Okay, so what in my view is wrong with Arendt's account of anti-Semitism? Well, to start with, let's look at what she even says anti-Semitism is. What is Arendt's conception of anti-Semitism? Basim TV yesterday, I imagine most of us were at his talk yesterday afternoon, he pointed out rightly that Arendt makes a strong distinction between Judeophobia on the one hand and actual anti-Semitism on the other hand. I am not so much contesting that distinction. I think the distinction is a real one, and historians have long disagreed exactly on how we draw, how and where we draw the line. My problem is that what Arendt says anti-Semitism actually is ends up being extremely narrow. And that shows up in a lot of places, but I want to read you a quick quote here from page 29 uh, of her book. She essentially says, excuse me one minute, she essentially says that social Judeophobia is, quote, a mere antipathy, mere antipathy, end quote, whereas anti-Semitism, in her view, has to be a political phenomenon. Otherwise, it's not anti-Semitism. Essentially, a, summary, a brief way of putting it is that for Arendt, anti-Semitism is more or less antipathy toward Jewishness that has been linked to or chained to or hitched to some other political program. If it is not put in the service of some political program, it doesn't count as anti-Semitism in her view. And here's the quote I want to read you. It happens to be a quote about the countries of Eastern Europe, and I'm going to ask you all to, to set aside for a moment the, the condescension that she shows toward Eastern European countries in this book, and instead focus on the concepts. She describes Eastern Europe as, quote, backward countries where the ubiquitous hatred of Jews made it almost useless as a weapon for specific purposes. When we unpack that, it's essentially a way of saying two things. One, Ubiquitous hatred of Jews is not in and of itself anti-Semitism on her terms. That doesn't mean that it's okie-dokie. It doesn't mean that she's fine and dandy with ubiquitous hatred of Jews. It just means that it doesn't count necessarily as anti-Semitic on her specific terms. What makes it, or what could potentially make it anti-Semitic, is if it became a weapon for specific political purposes. Now, for those of you who know the rest of Arendt's social theory, you know that her distinction between the social on the one hand and the political on the, on the other hand is absolutely central. It's one of the core distinctions running throughout all of her thought. Whatever we might make of the distinction, it runs into trouble on the, on the question of anti-Semitism for a lot of different reasons. Now, to complicate matters even further, from Arendt's point of view, this is slightly unfair to her, but from her point of view, everything that has to do with the social is kind of vaguely suspicious, sometimes not so vaguely. The social is not necessarily a good or positive or valorized category for Arendt, for whereas the political, she is strongly positive towards. Things that make it over the threshold of the political for Arendt are things that are worth engaging with, things that are worth arguing with. Now, because she doesn't want to do the anti-Semites the service of saying they actually were really and truly and genuinely political in her own terms, she has to make this interesting digression in Origins and essentially say that even though what makes anti-Semitism anti-Semitism is it's being harnessed to some larger political purpose, in truth, the political purposes of the anti-Semites are essentially anti-political. She sees anti-Semitism, again, going back to something that Jonathan pointed out, she sees anti-Semites as always being uh, in tension with the governing state of affairs in whatever country, in whatever social circumstances they find themselves in. She sees the anti-Semites as always being in antagonism to their own state. I can read you yet another quote here from Origins. Arendt argues that the anti-Semitic parties aimed, quote, to destroy the body politic of their own nation, end quote. 
And another point she writes, which group of people would turn anti-Semitic in a given country at a given historical moment depended exclusively upon general circumstances which made them ready for a violent antagonism to their government. Now it's easy to find similar phrases shot throughout the book. It's a, it's a really big theme for her. One of the several historical problems with that notion is it leaves most historical anti-Semites out of the picture. It doesn't just leave a few of them out of the picture, it leaves a whole big bunch of people who historians generally agree really were real life anti-Semites. They just don't get included in this definition. To choose one example from our own uh, German Jewish experience, the Völkisch movement, which some of you might be familiar with here. Unfortunately, it's a, it's a word that is hard to translate, but it essentially means a, a kind of ethno-nationalist, ethno-populist with strong racist undertones movement. The Völkisch movement in Germany was not trying to, quote, destroy the body politic of their own nation. On the contrary, they thought they were going to heal the body politic of their own nation precisely by ridding it of the scourge of Jewishness. If you could get rid of the disease of Jewishness, so the Völkisch thinkers thought, then you would heal, you would revitalize and regenerate the body politic, not destroy it. And just as a sort of minor but obvious uh, historical point, lots of anti-Semites were not in antagonism with their own states. Lots of them were uh, well in harmony with their own states. In fact, many anti-Semites essentially viewed, they essentially identified loyalty to their own state with hostility to the Jews. That was an important equation for a lot of anti-Semitic thinkers. Now that just doesn't make it into, into our account. That's okay. What we can do with that is simply say, when our rent is talking about anti-Semitism, she's actually talking about a sub, sub, subset of what the rest of us usually mean when we talk about anti-Semitism. I wish it were that easy, but I, I actually think it isn't because I think some of those distinctions end up dooming uh, important parts of the rest of her analysis of anti-Semitism, even though, as I said, I don't think they doom her uh, social theory as a whole. Okay. So aside from the problems with Arendt's conception of what anti-Semitism is, and the problems, as I see them, with her basic distinction between merely social antipathy and genuinely or not political anti-Semitism, I think there are some big, some fundamental problems with her understanding of what assimilation meant to especially German Jews. I'm a little bit out of my depth if I start addressing French and Russian and British Jews, but certainly in the German Jewish context, um, I think she really importantly misunderstands, misconstrues, misanalyzes the importance of the assimilation dynamic, and that that is in turn tied to a highly ambivalent sense of what Jewish difference means. She's very ambivalent about uh, the very existence of Jewish distinctiveness as such. Now, I have an interesting hypothesis to before that I only mean as a, uh, as a hypothesis. I'm not actually sure of this, but the hypothesis that I want to put forward as a possible explanation for why Arendt took such a dim view of assimilation in general is that it may have been a sort of residual effect of her previous Zionist convictions. Now by 1949, by the time she has finished Origins, she has become a very harsh critic of what by then was mainstream Zionism. She had of course in her youth been very active in, in Zionist organizations both in Germany and then uh, in France, but she slowly, from her point of view, what basically happened was the mainstream of Zionism moved very far to the right, whereas she thought she had stayed more or less in the same place that she was, but that had sort of left her now outside the major fold of the Zionist movement. I nonetheless think that it's possible that her earlier understanding of what constituted assimilation in the German Jewish context was so strongly refracted through her own then youthful Zionist lens that it led her to mistake some important historical dynamics. There is tons of historical literature out there about the debates between German Zionists and German assimilationists and, uh, and the different ways that they both understood assimilation. My basic charge against Arendt on this, on this uh, point is that she simply never distinguishes between what Gentile proponents of Jewish assimilation meant by assimilation and what Jewish proponents of assimilation meant by assimilation, again, in a specifically German context. That distinction is absolutely crucial. It's not nearly the case that the Gentile pro-assimilationists and the Jewish pro-assimilationists meant different things by assimilation. They certainly did. The problem is that they meant precisely contrary things. 
very, very briefly, and much too simplified, most Gentile proponents of assimilation, and that, for what it's worth, includes virtually every Philo-Semite that you can identify in late 19th and early 20th century Germany. Not that you can identify a whole lot of Gentile Philo-Semites in, in that period, but almost all the ones that you could identify, the friends of the Jews, virtually all of them held the position that assimilation meant the abandonment of Jewish identity, period. If you, were, if you were a Jew and you were going to assimilate into German culture from a Gentile pro-assimilationist perspective, what that meant was giving up your Jewishness. You would cease to be Jewish and become simply German, simply human, simply a person, or what have you. For most Jewish proponents of assimilation, in stark contrast, assimilation meant exactly the opposite. It meant becoming full and recognized and acknowledged members of German society while retaining a specific sense of Jewish distinctiveness. Arendt simply never draws that distinction between the two competing senses of assimilation, and I think it ends up uh, screwing up uh, her analysis. Now, for what it's worth, as a quick, um, as a quick sort of historical footnote, uh, Nas Ventbahn, actually, um, uh, maybe seven years ago now, you had a, um, you and, uh, you and your Schultz, I said, had a really nice essay. I have forgotten where it appeared, but it impressed me, where you looked at some things in the Hannah Arendt Archiv in Oldenburg, uh, and you offered the hypothesis that Arendt had actually changed her mind on the relationship between uh, social Judeophobia and political anti-Semitism in the course of writing Origins. Now, I can't speak to this because I've never even seen these documents, but the material you presented seemed pretty compelling to me. Basically, if I remember right, what you, what you were more or less saying was that she had started out seeing a much stronger link between social Judeophobia and political anti-Semitism, and then under the impact of the Holocaust, revised her own stance and tried to, to separate the, the two of them out much more strongly. Is that fair enough? Uh, summary. I find that a really compelling idea, and what I'd like to eventually, if I or somebody else keeps working on this, uh, uh, on this notion, is eventually look at a similar possibility for her own evolving understanding of assimilation and the ways that may or may not have been reflected in the successive versions or successive drafts of what became uh, the origins of totalitarianism. But I, I simply can't speak to the topic because I don't know the, the material. Okay, now. What all these things add up to are a whole series of, uh, essentially Arendt has adopted into her own narrative a long series of anti-Semitic assumptions. Jonathan put it nicely as sort of re-inscribing them. I'm, I'm inclined to be not quite as nice. I think that there are large stretches of the first third of origins that read like kind of a summary of anti-Semitic implications. They're like, it's like a parade of anti-Semitic cliches that are then embedded in much more thoughtful, much more uh, nuanced theorizing, but the cliches are still there. They're kind, of, uh, they're kind of undigested. Just to give you a couple of examples here, and this is not just about German Jewry, for what it's worth. It shows up in her work on South African Jews, which actually comes later in, uh, in Origins. Uh, French Jews, British Jews, she, uh, she harps on the arrogant nature of Jewish self-segregation. It is a very important part of her argument that Jews are the ones who separated themselves from Gentile society, not that Gentile society separated Jews out. She sees that as, as arrogant. Um, she sees an inordinate involvement in finance capital. Uh, Jonathan already mentioned that. That's, that's one of the absolute classic anti-Semitic chestnuts, and in many cases, it's just not true. It, is, it just doesn't hold up to historical scrutiny. The notion that Jews were, especially in the period that she is looking at, the notion that Jews were especially involved in finance capital is, it is inaccurate. Whatever we might make of it, even if it were accurate. Um, she attributes disreputable, disreputable business practices to a lot of Jews, uh, for that matter, disagreeable personal habits to lots of Jews, often meant sort of anonymously to refer to, quote, Jewish bankers or, quote, Jewish intellectuals. Those two phrases occur again and again and again, unmodified in her text. Sometimes she applies them to very specific Jewish individuals. Basically, there's this, it's like a rogues gallery of rootless types and of parasitical types, and they just keep reappearing. Uh, in her narrative. Now again, that's not, that's not fair to her argument, but it's important to recognize that those elements strongly color the text. So the question arises, how did that happen? How did these anti-Semitic elements sort of sneak their way into Arendt's narrative? I have a possible and only partial answer to that question. And that is, <clears throat> Arendt drew very heavily on anti-Semitic sources themselves. 
And I don't just mean that any historian of anti-Semitism obviously has to spend her his time reading a lot of anti-Semitic sources. That's what we build our narratives out of. That's not what I mean. I mean that would be drawing on anti-Semitic sources as your primary sources. What I mean is that Arendt drew very heavily on secondary sources by anti-Semitic authors. I'll give you two examples in a, in a second here. And that their own arguments about Jewish history and about the genesis of anti-Semitism strongly shaped uh, uh, her own argument. The two examples that I want to point out are Walter Frank, or uh, Walter Frank, I guess is how we would say him. He was a, um, he, until 1941, he, he lost an internal power struggle with uh, Rosenberg in 1941. But until then, uh, he was a very, very important up and coming young historical star. He was an actual trained historian. Um, the Nazis had, 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 had little trouble getting. Uh, philosophers and biologists and historians and lots of other academics <coughs> on their side. In fact, it was one of the big ones. He founded, uh, he was the leader of the Reichsinstitut für die Geschichte des Neuen Deutschlands, I think. The Reich Institute for the History of the New Germany. Um, uh, now, now Nazi. In fact, he killed himself in 1945. Once, uh, maybe a week or so before Hitler killed himself, once Frank realized that the war was lost, was no, there was no point in continuing since <coughs> Nazism had collapsed around him. Why even do it anymore? Um, now, Arendt definitely recognizes that Frank was a Nazi. She doesn't, she doesn't uh, uh, pull her punches about that. She also recognizes that he was an anti-Semitic historian. What she does is say that, nonetheless, despite that fact, his works can still be consulted with profit. Now, in my personal view, that notion is not, in principle, wrong. I can see occasions where that would be true enough. You can find anti-Semitic historians who still have interesting and more or less accurate material to provide. I don't think it's the case with Vaisa Frank, and then a, a lot of my paper here goes into detail about that, looking at Frank's work, looking at what Arendt says about him. In other parts of the text, she merely calls him the well-known historian, Walter Frank. You know, I suppose he was well-known in, in the Nazi area, but not, not really after 1945, unless you're looking at uh, committed Nazis. I don't think his own work actually helps her argument at all, and in several important cases I think it ends up strongly hurting her argument. But I want to jump to the second example, and that's much, much earlier from the first part of the 19th century, and that's a guy named Paulus, Paul, Paulus, Heinrich Paulus. He was a liberal uh, theologian, a Christian theologian, and his best known text is called Die Jüdische Nationalabsonderung. Something, something, something. It means uh, Jewish national se segregation, Jewish national separation or separateness, and he did not mean it as a compliment. <coughs> he meant that Jews have, very much as Arendt says, that Jews have separated themselves off from the rest of society for hundreds and hundreds of years, and that this is what accounts for all of their um, uh, uh, the unpleasant characteristics, and that if the Jews ever really want to get accepted, they're going to have to leave their Jewish characteristics behind. Once they can learn to do them, we magnanimous liberal Christians will be happy to accept them with open arms. Paulus was a fierce critic of emancipation. He's writing in the 1820s and 1830s, which is before emancipation has actually uh, 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 been fulfilled in the German lands. Arendt mistakes him crucially for a proponent of emancipation. I'm not entirely sure how to look at that. That's a flat out historical error. There isn't, there isn't really room for argument on that particular question. Every, if you want to go look up Heinrich Paulus, every other source you will find will describe Paulus as an enemy, an opponent of emancipation. If you read his own work, uh, you will see it very clearly. I don't know why, but Arendt mistakes him for a proponent, a supporter. Uh, of emancipation, and she basically likes the notion that she attributes to him, right there or wrongly, that individual Jews can overcome their own unsavory Jewish characteristics and make their way within Gentile society, even if there is not a uh, general uh, emancipation of the Jews. Now, I think we need to go one step further and not only figure out how did Arendt end up adopting all these anti-Semitic motifs in her own work, I want to figure out if, if my answer is partially true, that one of the reasons for that is she was simply immersed in anti-Semitic sources. She was working her way through, uh, thank goodness, she was doing pioneering work, working her way through these sources that are not very pleasant to read, and trying to do her best to offer her own narrative account, offer her own set of arguments built on top of that. I think one reason is her rejection of psychoanalytic categories. 
Arendt was, to say the least, not fond of psychoanalysis as a critical theory of anything, of the individual, of society, of uh, anything else. She simply didn't have much use for psychoanal psychoanalytic categories. There's lots of transference. There's lots of uh, projection. There's all sorts of psychodynamics that go on when you really immerse yourself in that material, and it's hard to draw yourself out once again and try to construct reasonable and non-anti-Semitic arguments on the basis of that material. And the hypothesis, again, this is purely speculative on my part, I, I have no access to the interior workings of Hannah Arendt's mind, but I want to put the possibility out there that maybe her own, um, uh, uh, up and her own um, antipathy toward psychoanalysis prevented her from doing that process vis-a-vis -vis her own work. Okay, I want to start to wrap up. Um, I don't think we should see this as a series of personal weaknesses on Hannah Arendt's part. That's exactly not uh, what I mean. Despite what I just said about that one hypothetical possibility, I don't see that as something that is sort of her uh, personal fault. I think what's much more fruitful is to see a lot of these flaws, if you agree that they are flaws, a lot of these flaws in Arendt's account of anti-Semitism, I think we can see them as representative of broader trends in both recent thinking and in thinking a half a century ago about Jewish-Gentile relations. Not just about the history of anti-Semitism, but more broadly about Jewish-Gentile relations. And when we take that perspective, it sort of helps to contextualize Arendt's own work, both its merits and its uh, uh, shortcomings. So that rather than uh, a kind of idiosyncrasy of hers, we can see this as a way of mapping anti-Semitic assumptions back onto the study of anti-Semitism itself. What Arendt's work, in a sense, shows us is that despite all of her other fascinating insights, despite her, her, uh, her notion of pariah and parvenu, all of that work, despite all of those insights, it nonetheless is possible, even for people who are trying to be aware of it, it is possible to import into our own work anti-Semitic assumptions while we are simultaneously explicitly arguing against anti-Semitic implications. It takes several levers, uh, excuse me, several <coughs> levels of self-reflection to try to dig that out. And I think many of us who work on this topic don't succeed in our own work. So it's not like I, uh, we don't succeed fully at that task in our own work. It's not like I want to hold up uh, our right for ridicule. I want to use her as an example of a very important social thinker who conspicuously failed to do this thoroughly enough uh, in her work. And I want to give three uh, very quick examples of, of what that can lead to uh, in Aaron's work and outside of it. One, the notion of pathologizing <coughs> Jewish distinctiveness rather than normalizing it. This comes up a lot in historical work on anti-Semitism. Not so much these days as I think it used to in earlier periods, but it's still definitely there. It's a big part of Arendt's own work. I think that's a mistake. People who look at the history of anti-Semitism, I argue, would do well to try to step back for a moment and contextualize the history of anti-Semitism within the broader history of other forms of conflict between two differently defined groups, whether we want to call them national groups or religious groups or ethnic groups or cultural groups, I don't care, we can argue about that, but I think we would want to pull back sometimes and look at, say, the broader history of, just in the modern era, the broader history of racial thought, the broader history of the emergence of new forms of national identity, new forms of nationalism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When you do that, you start to see, huh, a lot of the stuff that seems really weird in the history of, say, German-Jewish relations, in the history of the emergence of anti-Semitism, it actually shows up in a lot of other contexts, too. There are a lot of repeating patterns that we can identify. Second point, I think Arendt's emphasis on Jewish actions, Jonathan uh, sympathetically called it an interactionist uh, model. Actually, I, I agree with that sympathetic view of it, but the negative spin on that is to say that Arendt overemphasized Jewish actions, or in her own personal sense, Jewish misdeeds as the trigger of anti-Semitic uh, reactions. I think that, that there is still a lot of social truth to that. The internationalist model is, uh, is, is fully justified. However, in Arendt's specific version of it, it ends up obscuring a more fundamental truth, in my mind at least. And that more fundamental truth is the fact that Anti-Semitism is an ideology about Jews that is autonomous from, and at best, tangentially related to the actual conditions of Jewish existence. 
to repeat that. Anti-Semitism, to the extent that anti-Semitism is an ideology, anti-Semitism is a lot of things, but if we're talking about it as a discursive phenomenon, to the extent that anti-Semitism is an ideology, it is an autonomous ideology. It is not one that is directly drawn from empirical experience with Jews. Instead, it more or less works in the opposite direction. Anti-Semites bring a set of anti-Semitic assumptions to bear on the world. It's how they make sense of the world to begin with. And when they then happen to encounter Jews out in the real world, they map those anti-Semitic assumptions onto their interactions with Jews, rather than deducing their conclusions from real world empirical interactions with Jews. Third point. I think there is a strong tendency way beyond that, a very strong tendency among historians, among the philosophers, among a lot of folks, to view the history of anti-Semitism backwards through the lens of the Holocaust. In our, and that's a problem. In Arendt's case, the problem isn't really her fault. She was writing at a period when there just wasn't a whole lot of other literature on the topic available. She was once again doing path-breaking work in the immediate aftermath of the Holocaust. I, I, I want to I wanna sort of understand that and, and say this is not something I want to hold against her specifically. It's a much broader phenomenon. The reason that can be a problem, the reason it's a bad idea to read the history of anti-Semitism backwards through the lens of the Holocaust is that it can end up skewing our understanding of what does and does not count as anti-Semitism in the first place, to go back to the beginning of my presentation. If your model of what is really and truly anti-Semitic is someone who tries to kill every single last Jew he can possibly get his hands on and has the military and political apparatus of a huge industrialized state at his disposal in order to do so, there's not a lot of anti-Semites in history. And that's what it means to be an anti-Semite. Historically speaking, for what it's worth, before the Nazis came to power, <laughs> that matter, even after the Nazis came to power for a while. But before 1933, most anti-Semites, I'm going to put out a hypothesis there and see if people want to contest it. I argue most anti-Semites before 1933 not only did not favor a genocidal solution to the Jewish problem, and this is at odds with the work of other folks, uh, Paul Lawrence Rose, who might be here, he's at the, there are other people who radically disagree with my claim, but my claim is that most anti-Semites before 1933 not only did not endorse a genocidal solution to the so-called Jewish problem, they didn't even envision it. It did not occur to them. What they wanted to do was eliminate Jewishness. But they didn't think the way to eliminate Jewishness was to actually physically kill Jews. They thought it was any number of other things. Some of them thought, some of them thought it was expulsion. Get them out of our own particular country, over the borders. They won't be our problem anymore. Some of them thought it was precisely assimilation. Again, a radical Gentile version of assimilation, whereby you need to get entirely rid of your own Jewishness. There were lots of different, quote, solutions that different anti-Semites came up with. Very few of them came up with the notion of mass murder. So it's important to understand that the real history of anti-Semitism had all of these differences and distinctions and nuances in it that we tend to sort of collapse when we think about Nazism as an archetypal form of anti-Semitism. Nazism was an unusual form of anti-Semitism. It was not archetypal. It was an outlier. It was anonymous. Anyway, I nonetheless think, and here I will close, I nonetheless think that despite all the flaws that I see in Arendt's account of the historical genesis and development of anti-Semitism, I nonetheless think that we could use Arendtian categories to do what she did not do. I think we could use Arendtian categories to envision what she didn't, namely the possibility of collective solidarity and, if you want to call it, ethnic or cultural distinctiveness in tandem with, conjoined to, universal and cosmopolitan values, all within the context of a reconciled social totality i.e. the kind of social totality that none of us actually lives in, not like today's social totality, which is riven with divisions and distinctions and hierarchies and dominations and oppressions of various sorts, but a very different kind of society. If we envision that kind of society, which Arendt did in her other works, I think we could see a very different story emerging of the relationship between Jews and non-Jewish societies and non-Jewish states. But to do that, I think, which, which to my, to my sense, to my way of thinking, is a way of appreciating and commending the other elements in our social thought. In order to do that effectively, I think it will mean fundamentally reworking and <coughs> revising a lot of the basic categories that she brought to bear in her own account of anti-Semitism. Thank you very much.
with some very, very interesting thoughts on the rent. Uh, it, it seems to me that we, we all start with the agreement that we don't like eternal, we agree with her fully about the eternal anti-Semitism and the scapegoat theory. But then what we don't like is when she tries to say that Jews are part of the world who act in a world of which anti-Semitism is a part of it. We don't like that. We, we, the, the idea of the Jewish banker uh, who finances the state, but they finance the state because the bourgeoisie, the rising bourgeoisie don't want to. So there are structural reasons why a section of, of Jews finance the bank, they finance the peace treaties. So that what it seems to me is rather than saying she is being anti-Semitic in portraying this, she is trying to understand the situations Jews or certain sections of Jews were placed in because of the way that the, the modern nation state arose because of the notion of why the Jews got rights. It was always conditional. And she said the Jews were quite happy to stand outside the body politic uh, for various reasons. So what I think, what I like about that section is that she offers a non-romantic history of the complete innocence of the Jews, not of anti-Semitism. She's very clear that Jews are not guilty of the crimes that are alleged. But the finance capital myth, the uh, Jewish parvenu or pariah myth, what I like about her work, actually, is that she says Jews actually fulfilled that role. Then when anti-Semitism comes along, anti-Semitism as an ideology, as a key to history, comes along precisely at the moment that, that as she says, Jews get assimilated. They cease to be a separate political group. They get assimilated into the, the modern nation state. It strikes me that what she's doing is she's offering the political and social Jewish-Gentile relations that then get perverted, because they're no longer based on reality, perverted through the ideology of anti-Semitism. And what I think is so great about Lorraine, and I'm just being great about it because you've been critical, I mean, I'm very sympathetic with what you're saying, but what's so great about Lorraine is she gives the dignity of a place in modernity for the Jews, whereas Sartre says, you know, the Jew is the invention of the um, anti-Semite, Adorno and Horkheimer talk about the concept of the Jew, Bauman talks about the concept of the Jew. What's so great about Arendt is that the anti-Semitic concept of the Jew arises from real social and political relations and gets completely distorted and no longer attaches to reality. Otherwise, you're left with a situation where she writes the Jews out of history, and we're back to the eternal and scapegoat. So on the one hand, we might be critical of what she says about Jews, but methodologically, she has to do it. Otherwise, she falls back into a myth of a myth of sociology, uh, of sociology, of anti-Semitism. <laughs> Whoops. So, uh, and one final question, and it's, this is just a postscript. What do we mean by the social in the rent's work? Yeah, I, if I can uh, at least uh, respond to the first part, which I think is a really crucially important issue that you're raising here. I, I think this is a point of difference between Peter and I, because I actually wholly agree with you that this is an incredibly important part of Arendt's analysis, and that, you know, part of, I'm, you know, my book, I hope, is not just making a number of simple points, but one of the simple points that it is making is we need all of these, um, um, models for thinking about anti-Semitism, and that ultimately anti-Semitism is itself a multifaceted problem. We cannot theorize it only using one kind of model. So there are shortcomings of Safa's model, there are shortcomings of e in, in each of the um, um, paradigms that I'm looking at through paradigmatic figures. And I, I agree um, with you, actually, that, that one of the things that is crucially important has to do with the ways in which she specifically um, uh, places responsibility in um, uh, Jewish, non-Jewish interactions in terms of the role of Jewish elites within certain um, institutional fora that are, that are um, extremely important. And, and that is clearly who she aims her, her venom at. And, um, so the question becomes then, um, are there interactionist models that we can uh, load perhaps more than 
uh, uh, Arendt's own account. And one of the people that she cites um, extensively and, and, and applauds is Jacob Katz. And Katz is, of course, a very good example of an interactionist model that doesn't necessarily fall into the same kinds of traps. On the other hand, Albert Lindemann, for example, in Esau's Tears and in other works, is an atrociously terrible example of what can happen when you put forth an interactionist model that ultimately, full scale, blames the Jews for, uh, um, uh, for, for modern anti-Semitism. So, um, I'll also, maybe you want to respond to that, and then we can talk a little bit about, about the social, because um, I, I actually, I think I'm also um, a little bit at variance with Peter when it comes to her analysis of, um, of social anti-Semitism in the section on Jews and society. I mean, that's the way in which the social enters into, enters into the analysis of the history of anti-Semitism. And if I, if I can also, I, I, I am also, I really do want to suggest that we take Arendt seriously as a historian. I think she's, she's a, an extremely acute, insightful historian who in all kinds of ways um, um, helps us methodologically, precisely, uh, to, to uh, think through some of the ways in which we might want to approach problems like anti-Semitism. And I'm very um, uh, sympathetic in particular of, of her own, what we might call after Derrida, her own kind of deconstructive historiography. That is to write a, a history that attempts to destroy the object that it and analyzes. Um, um, and I think that you know one of the places that we can see some of the brilliant insights of Arndt is precisely in the, the, the chapter on Jews and society, in which what she does is move from this earlier account of a political and economic analysis towards a social analysis, and the ways in which she does that through concentrating on certain kinds of figures. Um, I, I think that one of the things that we want to think about in, in, the, in, in that moment are what are the discursive and, in, and, and what are the dis discourses, practices, and institutions that led to the um, notion of assimilation itself being a, um, a lyrical illusion, let's say. It, it doesn't matter who articulates it ultimately, but, but what are, are the, the, the specific social conditions that preempt its possibility? And in that sense, and, and this is, a, this is for me the real brilliance, and what then become the psychological effects of that on those who exist in those uh, forms of, uh, uh, in, in those kinds of, of social forms? And it seems to me that, that Arendt's analysis of the Jewish condition in modernity is extremely illuminating in, in, in this regard. Um, but at the same time, there are moments, right? And these are the moments that I think that we want to um, um, call her on precisely because they, they help us in a deeper way to understand what some of the problems might be in the way she understands anti-Semitism. So at least that, I'm going to say that much, not try to sort of um, develop what's Arendt's notion of the social, how does the social work in relationship to the political, because actually I'm, you know, I'm less... Uh, um, equipped to, to uh, deal with Arndt as a, as a political theorist. There, there are people here who are probably much more equipped to, to do that kind of work than I am. So, I don't have a lot to add to that. Um, one, one person I can sort of piggyback on is the late Jillian Rose. Folks who know her work might know her book, The Broken Middle. The Broken Middle. She has a wonderful uh, uh, section in the middle of that book, which is a, a lengthy and sympathetic critique of Arnon's social political distinction. It's very close to my own, very critical perspective on that. But for what that's worth, I see that more from my own political philosophy and not so much, quote, as a uh, historian. That's a, that's a different set of questions. You can agree or disagree on that topic uh, and still come to similar conclusions about some of the things that undercut uh, this was the book of anti-Semitism in Chicago. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'll follow the, this discussion up if I may. Um, one of the things I think you were raising, Jonathan, was on um, 
meaning of the word origins in this. And that's what's at stake in origins. And I think, if I remember right, in her reply to Ferglund, she uses terms of elements or right. something like that, with different elements, not so much necessary conditions, but just different factors that come into the story to, to follow through your um, um, analogy. And I wonder if one can reread some of the section of anti-Semitism anti in that light. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of different, like a, almost like a tapestry being uh, constructed. So one of the elements is, um, which I think, I mean, she's a great reader of de Tocqueville, and she was very influenced by de Tocqueville's analysis of racism um, in the United States. Um, and I think one of the elements is uh, is loss of power. So you know, the emphasis on the banks and the changing role of the banks uh, seems to me to be about the loss of a certain power that, that a small section of the Jewish elite might have had at one point, and then kind of is taken over by other factors. And then um, the second. I think a sort of second aspect of it, which comes out very strongly in the sort of um, in the discussion of society, is um, a loss within the Jewish community of a certain set of relationships that was associated with um, that kind of uh, Jewish elite. So a sort of loss of community. Um, and rightly or wrongly, I think that's a sort of fairly strong thematic in the work. And then a third and very kind of interesting one, to my mind, um, is uh, it's to do with, and it's very much taken from the top of this critique of the way in which assimilation and racism converged in the States, um, is the way in which um, with the sort of decline of certain notions of Jewish community and Jewish culture and Jewish religion with assimilation, um, what replaced it was a notion of Jewishness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I simply am a Jew. Um, um, and she was worried about all these things. Um, and then fourthly, um, and also taken, I think, from the Tocqueville and her, um, uh, a growing notion of resentment that how comes these people have equal rights when they don't really deserve equal rights, so a resentment outside. And all those factors sort of come together. And for me, um, I think what she was talking about there was very much 19th century anti Semitism, uh, which was interactive in her view, rightly or wrongly. But she, at the end of that section, she talks about, you know, the golden age, and everyone thought after the um, uh, Dreyfus case that things would get better. Catholic Church had lost its influence, and so on, a little bit. Um, uh, everyone thought it was getting better. And she said, you know, what surprised everyone is that rather than things getting better, what emerged was, I think she uses the word um, crackpot theories. <laughs> Um, and the crackpot theory, so when, you know, that whole world of 19th century anti-Semitism, which had something to do with interaction, um, sort of re-emerged, but without any of that substance. And all you got was crackpot theory. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think, you know, perhaps one useful distinction might be between 19th and 20th century forms of anti-Semitism, historically. And her view, again, rightly or wrongly, I'm not really in a position to judge it too well, um, but her view that there's a real distinction between the two, and that there's a connection with reality in the 19th century, which goes missing in after the First World War. Mm -hmm. Can I briefly draw sure. that? Before you respond, because I'm actually I would argue exactly that uh, in the wrong direction. I, first of all, I, these were two absolutely illuminating, wonderful papers, and I'm, I'm really happy. I hope you, you will still decide to, 
Oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, but I think like maybe to, to try to bridge the gap, I really would like to, to, to hear more from you uh, on that, uh, um, about uh, the question of an interactionist model. And I think Robert just raised that issue. Now, on the one hand, first of all, I don't think the distinction between our rent and that has been raised here several times, also uh, uh, by you, Jonathan, uh, between critical theory, critical social theory, practical school, and our rent is so big as it's uh, portrayed here, because actually Jews as agents come into play in, in Frank, the Frank of school free writing as well. It's not Sartre. I mean, there's some truth to Sartre, but Sartre looks at 20th century anti Semites, and that's exactly the distinction that our rent makes that uh, Adorno and Horkman make. Originally, you think of the third uh, thesis of the uh, elements of anti-Semitism, the lack of enlightenment, it talks about Jews as the bankers. Or even the, uh, in the sixth thesis of the elements, uh, where they talk about the notion of false projection. False projection doesn't mean that everything is wrong. It's a false projection, it's a false generalization. So actually, the notion that, that Jews represent a homeland of, uh, without frontiers, there's of course some truth to that, right? There's some truth to this utopia, actually, the utopia that Adorno and Walker endorse, of course. But uh, um, uh, so, on the one hand, there is actually uh, uh, an interaction of some sort that Jews have come to represent modernity. Uh, and it's only Jews who have come to represent, no other minority presenting that modernity. That's like the way anti Semitism is not racism. It's Jews who have come to represent modernity, and it's because they have been granted, if only temporarily, rights that others have not been granted in, in this moment when uh, modernity arose, because they have been bankers, because they have been representing all these kind of modern uh, uh, elements of society and the sun of that. So on the one hand, there is interactionist background, on the one hand. On the other hand, we have to make this distinction. Uh, at least, I think, uh, that's the way I understand. All right, that's, I think, uh, Peter, why, uh, um, sorry, in this case, Jonathan, uh, why I think uh, what was somewhat missing in your model is that Yes, she talks about ruptures. She writes the history of ruptures, right? And so she, I think she's very genealogical in that sense. Uh, we have to look at the ruptures. And there's a major rupture here that she focuses on uh, in the turn where anti-Semitism becomes modern anti-Semitism and then eventually becomes totalitarian anti-Semitism, which has nothing to do with the objects of, of, uh, 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 of perception. Not of hatred. She doesn't use the word hatred because hatred she attributes to group conflict, right? So it has nothing to do with the object. Anti-Semitic <coughs> theories, as she describes the 20th century, is total Sartre. It's total Sartre, and it's total, and there's no uh, relation. It emerged against the background of an interaction, but it's no longer an interaction. And she insists on this rupture, on this distinction that we have to make. Uh, and so on the one hand, I think, like, when we situate this in those other theories, there are more parallels than we think. And on the other hand, we have to emphasize and see this rupture, and that was, like, the one part, maybe, because you only have 20 minutes, uh, which was missing in your paper, uh, which I otherwise uh, so, so that, that there, there is this rupture which changes also her model of, of solid storytelling between uh, talking about interactions between uh, Jews and the modern world. Yeah, these are, I, for me, these are extremely helpful um, uh, c comments. Um, and, I, and I do think this issue that both of you are, are raising about um, uh, ruptures, breaks within the history of anti-Semitism is crucial because this is, of course, another uh, very important element within uh, within um, Arendt's work. And I think there, that uh, something that I do think needs to be added back into the way in which I try to reconstruct the history um, emphasizes must must emphasize more the point that you're making, which is that um, uh, totalitarian anti-Semitism, let's say. Um, looks quite different from 19th century anti-Semitism. But just a couple qualifications to that. First of all, Arendt's model is not only a history of ruptures. And part of what I like, actually, about Vogelin's uh, review is that what, what he makes clear is that it's a history of discontinuities with, co with continuities built into them. And that if you look closely at her text, there is, there is an overlap between these different moments. And what interests me is what provides the causal nexus for those overlaps. And where I think Arndt sometimes runs into problems is the ways in which uh, um, her understanding of uh, um, Jews functions as a causal link. And that's where I think she actually runs into certain kinds of problems. So that if you go back and look at the, uh, uh, you know, obviously you, you uh, laid out um, completely correctly some of the elements that Arendt uh, lays out. And I cut out entirely here my reconstruction of Arendt's uh, story of anti-Semitism. Um, 
um, even if I need to uh, sort of add precisely what you both point to crucially as, as, as differences also. But if you go back and look at it, the golden age that she talks about is not the golden age after the Dreyfus Affair, if I'm remembering correctly. She argues that the Dreyfus Affair is the dress rehearsal of the 20th century. This is, her famous, this is a famous uh, um, uh, um, line, I think, uh, in the origins. And it, that line itself gives you a sense of, of the ways in which this is also a history of continuity. So partly we do need to think about what exactly those continuities are and then what, um, how much of an interactionist model can we continue to um, uh, embrace you know, as, as you go forward, as far as that's concerned. The, the golden age, I, I think, happens actually in the 19th century. It does have to do, a, am I getting it wrong? I think, what, I think you know, it's a textual point, I suppose, but um, I think what she, her argument is that the Dreyfus case was, and both are true, I think, it was a dress rehearsal. But after the Dreyfus case, as Lady, I mean, she's talking about France there specifically, uh, but after the Dreyfus case, there was legislation um, uh, dissolve, not dissolving, but attenuating the uh, political status of the Catholic Church. Right. And the Catholic Church was considered the main kind of force, um, institutional force behind the Dreyfus case. So, um, and it was a period of rapid assimilation of French. Jews. So in that sense, um, I think she saw both as a dress rehearsal and then a kind of age of illusion in a way, right. where everything looked as if it was going in the right direction. And she doesn't say a lot about it, but sort of there's a kind of irony there. And she just sort of alludes to it. And then, and then the next moment, here in the post-First World War period, everything's changed. I, I think the second point is just the point that I want to take from both of your comments, at least in terms of my presentation, re reconstruction of RN. I think that that second point is a really crucial one to emphasize. The other one, we would have to go back to the text. And I sort of read the Dreyfus Affair chapter a little bit differently, mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, but, but that's just despite the point. And I, and I think that the way that you put this, Robert, in terms of sort of saying, um, part of what you have to do is reconstruct the elements. I mean, remember, it's not only elements, it's elements that crystallize. That's the crucial thing. And, and, and it's only when you get uh, the crystallization of certain elements that you can appreciate the complex, you know, synchronic and diachronic structures that she's working with in terms of the temporality of how this all comes together. Um, but I'll just leave that to the side and take the comment, the, the criticism to light. I'd like to take this into another direction. Uh, my background is not a scholar of anti-Semitism. My background is in the field of history, background is in social work, political science, etc. And uh, in 1954, I was a student of Hannah Arendt oh. at the New School for Social Research. Uh, her husband, Heinrich Blucher, uh, was essentially concerned with human rights. That was the key situation. To me, the anti-Semitism issue is really incidental uh, in terms of his thinking, in terms of her thinking at that point, as expressed, even though she visited the uh, Eichmann trial and wrote on that. Uh, the question in terms of the protection of human rights is a continuing question in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. Uh, the chapter on Dreyfus, etc., it, it's voluminous, but the real pitch that I got was essentially human rights. And the question that I've heard raised and that I've read raised recently, Daniel Pipes' article, uh, and also uh, the uh, Jerusalem uh, uh, um, uh, group, uh, the question in terms of human rights, that when Israel was constituted, it was seen as human rights protected by the state. This was Hannah Arendt's view. How do you protect human rights politically is the situation. That the demonization of Israel at the present time is taking place in the post-human rights situation and the uh, view essentially that states do not protect human rights. EU and other organizations and for the Muslims, the Ummah is the protection of human rights. So the question that I raise now is, uh, 
not the causes, but the political conditions for human rights which make anti-Semitism less likely. And to me, the errant approach has been a guiding perspective in my life because the origins of totalitarianism then reflect what's taking place now with Islam uh, in terms of totalitarian Islam uh, moving in terms of a total system engulfing fatalism and uh, 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 transcending uh, uh, with metaphysical truths that uh, uh, transcend. So I'd like to raise the question, in terms of human rights, do you feel that the state is the protector of human rights, or that or the EU, that Israel should be demonized, the state is against human rights, that we've got to eliminate the state? It's a good question. Maybe a better way of trying to answer it is not so much what did Jonathan and I think, but maybe what would an Aventian answer to that question be? And I suppose it depends on how we understand her conception of the state. I think Arendt had a, a commendably unorthodox understanding of what the state is, and that interesting led her, interestingly led her to argue that totalitarianism was not, as many people would tend to see, it was not a sort of uh, hypostatized, you know, cancerous outbreak of the state writ large, but was actually the destruction of the state. She saw totalitarianism as uh, the negation of a state properly constituted. So my, my best guess is that an Arendtian answer to that would be states, when they are done rightly, when they usually aren't in her view, but when they are done rightly, can and will and should be, um, if not guarantors, at the very least, um, suitable frameworks for encouraging the continual respect for human rights, but that what happened to states in the course of the 19th and 20th century was um, they sort of went way off course and ended up um, uh, having non-state bodies take over the functions of the state and that ended up canceling out any chance of, uh, of human rights. But I don't know about that. The rent is very clear about this. There's a whole chapter on precisely this issue. Of course, the book is dedicated to kind of so there's a clear influence, and, and uh, we know from Young Brule's biography that uh, you know Blucher has a very important influence in terms of her, her thinking, as would be obvious uh, um, in terms of this. There's an entire chapter, again, an extraordinarily illuminating chapter on the question of the relationship between universal human rights and the nation state. And her whole argument in that chapter is that there is an inherent contradiction in the notion of universal human rights because it is only in light of state formations that human rights have the capacity to be protected. And, there, and it's the trun it, 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 it functions in a transitional uh, um, moment, a pivot moment within the, the history of the origins that she, that she uh, traces. Because what she's interested in doing is theorizing what ends up happening when people become stateless to their rights. And so there are a number of theorists, uh, uh, Judith Butler and Agamben and a number of others who go back to that chapter to look at the ways in which Arendt attempted to theorize the right to have rights. In, uh, in, 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 transnational frame, in, a, in a transnational framework, or in a framework something along the lines of the United Nations, as opposed to within the framework of nation states, Precisely because part of what she theorized in the, in the um, development of the 20th century is this massive problem of refugees. And those refugees might be economic refugees, they might be refugees as a result of political uh, um, instances of dictatorship and persecution. And this, there are reasons why theorists are going back to Arendt because that ha has proven to be an extremely prescient uh, um, insight on her part about the disconnect between, on the one hand, the, the universal, uh, um, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, Kantian, yeah. right? The, the French Revolution moment of, of uh, the Declaration of Universal Human Rights, and uh, what happens with the dissolution of nation states in the context of the development of mass society in, in the course of the 20th century and the unfolding of, of uh, of, of, of attacks on the, on the nation state. So now what the role is in terms of human rights and Israel and uh, where Islamic conceptions of human rights are, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go there.
Um, <laughs> that's a complicated issue that, that's a little bit beyond uh, um, an understanding of Arendt on anti-Semitism, which is the focus of the panel here. But Pipes suggests there's a need for a new paradigm, that the old paradigm in terms of the states providing rights is gone. That there's a new paradigm, it's more Kantian now, of globalism, essentially, and Uma, that the state doesn't protect rights, and therefore you demonize the state because it gets involved in that. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I think that a useful place to start in terms of this discussion might be, um, at least for me it would be, um, Sam Boyne's recent revisionist history of human rights, uh, uh, the lost utopia, human rights in history, which has just come out at, at, at Harvard. He argues as well that there, there has a, that human rights actually emerges very late. It's only really crystallizes as an as an international movement in the 1970s. He argues that this is the case for a number of reasons, including disillusionment about. Um, a whole number of factors having to do with national liberation struggle, struggles, the, the beginning of the dissolution of, of, of Marxism and, and other universalist um, frameworks for thinking about it. So I think human rights has emerged as a new kind of global um, um, category. Um, and, and there's lots of thinking to be done in terms of that. And I think some of the really interesting work is being done by, by people like Butler, for example, in terms of thinking about what exactly it means to uh, um, make the claim that there is a right to have rights. And remember, in Arendt's work, this is a very full throttle embrace of economic rights, of rights to education, of the kinds of things that you actually see in the development of what happens after 1948 in the UN in terms of the elaboration of a, a, a very, very broad set of rights that, that, we, um, uh, that we have a right to simply because we are a part of the human species. And, and, and as human beings, this is what can, uh, um, uh, creates the foundation for our very humanity, right? This, this is a very Arendtian uh, uh, trajectory, it seems to me, so. In addition to Sam Moyne's book, I think, Robert, aren't you working on something similar right now yourself? I am, yeah, I am. I think, I mean, I don't have much to add to what you said. I mean, just to emphasize, I think that uh, for, um, I think it's right at the beginning in one of the prefaces of her work, she talks both about um, the kind of new law on earth embracing the whole of humanity, which looks you know, something like what we call human rights um, law, but also about uh, new forms of political community. Um, and I mean, what strikes me is that, uh, and it's really a question for you, is that um, in that chapter on decline of the nation state and, and the end of the rights of man, the emphasis is very much on the decline of the nation state. And that's sort of slightly kind of, it's a kind of, it's strange if you read most histories because she's talking about the decline of the nation state precisely at the moment when all kinds of new nation states are being born and the whole system of nation states is emerging. So I presume that the decline of the nation state, but I'd like to sort of throw it back to you, the decline of the nation state is, a, is more of a normative than a historical notion. Oh, it, means, for our... it means that the, I don't know, that's a question to you, but uh, a defined nation state, perhaps in the sense that the original kind of republican <coughs> view of the nation state as embracing all citizens and giving rights to all citizens sure. is now being displaced by something else which is much nastier. Sure. I, um, I'm probably a bad person to ask about that. I'm an anarchist, so I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a good person to ask about the state. But, but again, I think one possible Arendtian answer has to do with what I see as her, her very her highly unusual sense of what a properly constituted democratic or republican polity would look like. And in her terms, she sees it as a state, but it's very unlike what I think most mainstream political theory thinks of as the state. I'm thinking of her book on revolution, parts of uh, Men in Dark Times, and thinking about Rosa Luxemburg, the extent to which she was very impressed by councilist movements in Germany and Hungary. She saw the possibility of a genuine political engagement that looks more like ancient Greek 
whole line, uh, than it does like uh, modern nation states. But as I read her, she sees that as a better version of the state rather than as an alternative to the state that is entirely possible, but I just understand her on that point. Yeah, I, I, I guess, I mean, in, in, in terms of that specific issue, I do think that, that Arendt is prescient in terms of thinking about um, the erosion of the role of the nation state in, in as a um, as a mechanism for all kinds of things, right? Um, but I think the point that you're making is a really interesting one in terms of you know what does it mean exactly to be talking. First of all, she's looking at it. She's looking retrospectively. And she thinks that over the course of the 20th century, there's been a process of the dissolution of nation-state power, the rise of <laughs> forms of massification that have led to atomization um, as opposed to uh, um, individual citizenship with, you know, uh, with all the um, aspects that go along with citizenship in a polis in which one can engage in shared community through dialogue and debate and contestation. Those are all the elements that she ascribes to the political. And, and she sees a massification of what she calls the social. So this goes to David's question earlier about the relationship between uh, um, the social and the political. And as Peter said, you know, she sees the, the, the social in negative terms and the political in positive terms. But there's a big problem here. I mean, that, that you're raising for me in terms of the um, in terms of Arendt's own relationship to the the um, struggle. Of struggles of national liberation in the 1950s and 1960s, and that have to do with Arndt's own understanding of Africa, understanding of colonialism, understanding of um, you know those those kinds of struggles. So uh, there's there's been a lot written on that critically. That's you know uh, I don't know I don't know if we should close the session because it looks like we're losing. Yeah. Thank you very much.